Hollywood Casino Press Box on the all-new Five Night of the Fan. We're broadcasting live from Llewellyn's in Soulard, and we want to introduce the St. Louis Cardinals opening day party brought to you by Llewellyn's Pub in Soulard, Budweiser, Stoli Vodka, and STL Inflatables. Starting at noon this Sunday, the opening day party will kick off with outdoor entertainment such as a giant beer pong, a pitch reader, a Cubs paintball challenge, and other fun interactive games. There will be great food and drink specials inside Llewellyn's as well as the street side bar. And i got to tell you, Llewellyn's has tremendous food. There's a reason they've been around since 1975. We're going to be broadcasting live here all day long. Come by and have a great lunch at this classic Irish pub. If you'd like to be a part of the program, Hollywood Casino Press Box, Winning Streak Listener Line, 855-282-8255. Lions Choice Text Line, that same number, 855-282-8255. Show content brought to you by the Bomberito Automotive Group. Our opening monologue is brought to you by Gateway Motorsports Park. And let's begin with lap one. He's a 34-year-old catcher with eight gold gloves, seven all-star games, and two world championships. He has authored some of the most famous moments in Cardinals history, like this moment in Game 7 of the 2006 NLCS. He hits it in the air to left field. Back is Chavez. At the wall, this ball is gone. Two-run home run, Yadier Molina. And St. Louis takes a 3-1, to one, ninth yeah. inning, Game 7 lead. Now, I believe that Yachty still has a little work to get to the Hall of Fame, get to 2,000 hits, and he's got to be in. And that won't be easy. Last year he had 164 hits, and if he did that for three more years, he would still be a little short. Uh, maybe he doesn't get 2,000, but if he gets a few more gold gloves. I mean, how could you keep a winner and the best defensive catcher of his generation out, let's just say, if he has 10 gold gloves? So last night, after Ken Rosenthal reported it's a three-year deal worth anywhere between 55 and 65 million, um, and it is expected to make him the highest-paid catcher on an average annual basis, I talked with John Mozeliak, and he told me that he's optimistic, but it's not done. It's certainly going to get done. You don't have this mom, this much momentum, and then have the thing all of a sudden stop, and it should. So what if the last year, let's just say it's a four-year deal. So what if the last year of the contract will likely not be a lot of bang for your buck? Uh, the Cardinals has some shortages on their team. Depth on the starting staff, plus maybe great defensive players. But cold, hard cash is not one of the shortages the Cardinals have on their team. And we're going to talk much more about this with Ricky Horton coming up at 1030. Cardinal broadcaster Rick Horton will join us at 1030. The soccer saga. And we'll talk with Frank Viverito about this at 1045. You hear these people trying to paint this deal as one that will actually hurt people in the city. It will decrease the amount of police on the streets and destroy schools. And you hear the economics of the deal are just bad for the city. Well, yesterday on television, I interviewed a man who's been covering stadium deals for 20 years. The economist from Washington U, a contributor from Forbes magazine. And we were live at 6 o'clock on News Channel 5 with Dr. Patrick Risch. Take a listen. Is this a fiscally responsible deal? Frank, there is no doubt in my mind that this is one of the most fiscally responsible public-private partnerships in sports financing that I've ever seen. Are you 100% sure that there'll be more money coming into the city in taxes than going out like the SC, STL people have alleged? I, I absolutely believe that. Again, I've looked at the numbers myself in the fall very carefully. I've also looked at some other reports that have been done for the group, and there's no doubt in my mind that when you look at the fact that, again, only 39% of the construction it would be coming from public sources. And even that, a large portion of that, is coming from a use tax where people that are going to the facility are ultimately paying that. So it's not a tax that's being pushed onto city residents as some are claiming. 
Yeah, what about the opposition who say this is corporate welfare? Frank, the people that are saying that, have they looked at the economics of Major League Soccer? Have they looked at the economics of other professional sports teams? Uh, in Major League Soccer, you have several teams, according to r reports in Forbes and CNN, that teams are having a hard time earning short-run operating profits, okay? Entrepreneurs like the folks here in St. Louis are getting involved because they see the long-term hope and prosperity for this league. They see franchise values rising. They see attendances climbing. They see a larger media rights deal somewhere down the road in the future. 30 seconds left. What about the commitment to the community in this whole deal? Frank, uh, this community benefits agreement that was agreed to between various city leaders and SC STL investors is unprecedented. There's going to be so much give back to this community and the city of St. Louis. It's, it's really unprecedented and adds to the value of the overall deal. By the way, the SCSTO group revealed that they're exploring the possibility of getting a women's expansion team. And that league is starting to grow, too. Been around for five years. And, you know, they draw 16000 per game in Portland. So it's just more events that could happen at that stadium uh, right by Union Station. I, I got to tell you something. I, I went through the video last night. I had a photographer uh, go by there. I gave him the precise address of, of that piece of crap land that nothing is happening right now. It's just completely empty, completely vacant, no energy, nothing on there. And then, you know, then you dissolve out of that to a 20,000 state-of-the-art stadium packed. And how about uh, the, the MLS, the women's teams, uh, championship games like in lacrosse or small college football, concerts? Wow. Lap three. So what exactly is the SCSTL group doing to sell the product? Because let's face it, like if you're watching local news, you don't see advertisements or anything like that. You don't hear it on, you know, local radio shows. But they are doing rallies all over town, including one last night in South St. Louis at St. Raphael. And I want you to listen to this report from our reporter, Jacob Long. We need something new in our city to light a fire under the people in this city. And that fire, according to SCSTL officials and fans, a more than $200 million professional soccer stadium next to Union Station. You know, if we're not willing to invest in our city, then how is a business going to say, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense for us then to throw uh, our investment into St. Louis as well. The ownership group made their final pitches Thursday night to South City voters, arguing the stadium will create hundreds of jobs and generate millions for the city. We feel that this has an impact much broader than just bringing a soccer team to St. Louis. At issue on Tuesday is Propositions 1 and 2. One is a half cent sales tax hike for a Metrolink expansion that would trigger an increase in the use tax. And two would ask to redirect 60 million in public funds from the increase in the use tax to help fund the stadium. They will get back $78 million. So there will be a 17 to $18 million net return for the city. But not every soccer fan is sold. I love soccer. I played soccer my entire childhood. 20th Ward Alderwoman Kara Spencer says it's a bad gamble that leaves only St. Louis taxpayers on the hook. We're going to need to have regional conversations about these regional amenities. We're going to have to come together as a region to figure out how to pay for them. Well, we'll see what happens. The, the pro soccer stadium entourage, I believe, is stronger. In fact, I've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, although Brendan and Brian disagree with me. The reason I think it's going to pass is because I believe the people that really want soccer are going to plan their Tuesdays about getting to the polls and voting. And then there's a large apathetic, ba apathetic base who may not vote at all. And that's why I think this is going to pass. And you know, and I, at the end of our interview with Dr. Patrick Risch, I asked him, and I'm telling you something, I don't know if he listens to the program, I know he's been traveling, he said the exact same thing. So I don't know. Most people I run into, though, almost everybody I run into, think it's not going to pass. We'll find out. I'm just, you know, cautiously optimistic about it. And they will have a celebration of soccer at the soccer park on Saturday uh, before the FC game, Isaac Bruce is going to be there. Kavanaugh, Woodcock, hopefully Edgerly. It'll be it'll be crazy. I think it'll be a lot of fun on Saturday night. 
I mean, think about this. On Tuesday night, we're either going to be celebrating or completely deflated. Lap four. Hey, the Predators got beat. Blues uh, can make it a three-point advantage tonight if they beat Colorado. And CBC, by the way, would be favored against Stan Kroenke's hockey team. So the sweet schedule is working well for the Blues. And it's not like, you know, they're like Coach Snyder, Kansas State, where they work this out, where they have a soft schedule. This is the way it works. I mean, they all play the same schedule. It's just working out well that the Blues are playing the two worst teams in hockey a lot down the stretch. Big game Sunday, 3 o'clock, Nashville at home. How wild will downtown be on Sunday, 3 o'clock for the Blues, 7.30 for the Cardinals. Great story in Arizona for the uh, for the Blues, too. Vladimir Tarasenko taking good care of an 11-year-old cancer patient named Ari Dugan. Flew out there with the team, courtesy of Yachty, I mean of uh, Vladimir. Scored the game-winning goal, too. Unbelievable. Kelly Chase was on the morning after yesterday and talked about this sweet little girl who has battled cancer all her life. It was awesome. It was awesome. It's been great, the whole trip with her. Um, she, uh, she's a special little girl, and uh, she told me yesterday Vladdy was going to, don't worry, Vladdy's going to score for her, and he did. And um, Just really energetic, and, and to, to be battling what she's battling, she's been fantastic. So, uh, great Great job of the Blues once again showing the human side of the game and, and, and humanizing it and putting it in perspective. And uh, this little girl certainly has uh, enlightened a lot of people on some things and what a great attitude. Nobody figures it out better than the Blues. Nobody reaches out to the community better than the Blues. Nobody just, they just get it. And they always have. All right, lap five. Quick NBA thought. Now, I said recently that we have to start recognizing some of our present players on the all-time team. Like, for instance, I always had Larry Bird at the small forward and, you know, maybe a Carl Malone at the power forward spot. But Bob Ryan told me on the radio, he says, no, no, you just put LeBron on there with Larry and you'll get plenty of rebounds there. You don't have to have a four. So the centers, and I've always said, I'm not going to pick because it's either Russell, Wilt, or Chamberlain. I mean, it's Russell, Wilt, or Kareem. Recent Hollywood Casino press box guest, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I should say. And the guards are Magic and Michael. And I have Kobe and Oscar on the second team. But what we're seeing out of Russell Westbrook, I mean, before it's all said and done, he's going to be on one of these top three teams. He is the most athletic you know, guard I think I've ever seen. More athletic than Jordan, if that's possible. Did you see what he did the other night? He had a triple-double with 57. Guys that have triple-double, you know, if they got to get to 10 assists, are doing it with, like, 25 points. Not with 57. And he's on pace to average a triple-double. He's a guard that's averaging 10 rebounds a game. 10 rebounds a game as a guard. Now, you know, Oscar did it once, but keep in mind, That was in an era when there were much more missed shots, so much more available rebounds. Look at the shooting percentages back then. I mean, I think what we're seeing out of Russell Westbrook this year with his triple-double, it's one of the five greatest individual seasons in NBA history. You had Wilt averaging 50. You have Oscars triple-double. Jordan had a season where he averaged 37, 5-5. And And then Bird had that year where he... Went over 90% from the line, 50 from two, and 40 from three, 28, 7, and 7. But this year by Russell Westbrook, how does a guard in these times average 10 rebounds a game? Unbelievable. I hope he does it. All right, uh, last six, stream of consciousness. Final four thoughts. You know what I find interesting is if you think about, like, the true blue blood programs in the country, Kentucky, Duke, UCLA, Kansas. Interesting, they're all blue, too. Uh, You know what they all have in common most of the time? One and done. Kentucky always has a lot. Duke always has a lot. And UCLA and Kansas have at least one this year. The other blue blood who also wears blue, North Carolina, has none. And they're going to trot out there at the Final Four a bunch of juniors and seniors in their starting lineup. 
and they're likely going to win it all. It's nice to have one and dones. But let me tell you something, folks. I would have a I would rather have a very good player for four years than a superstar for one. Spoke with somebody very close to the Mizzou basketball program yesterday, and I said, What are the odds that John Tay Porter, Michael Porter's six foot ten inch brother, who's going to be a senior in high school next year, what are the odds that he skips his senior year of high school, gets his GED, and then plays for Mizzou and his brother Michael next year. He said, this is a very high-ranking basketball official here, 60-40, he stays in high school. Stay tuned. A piece in USA Today that college coaches will soon, with their all their, um, you know, coaches' shows and shoe contracts and all that side money plus, you know, the deal they're actually getting from the university, that it will soon exceed the $10 million a year mark. Now, look, I'm not one of these people who's ever jealous of anybody making a lot of money at all. More power to it. That's what makes America great. But you know what I have a problem with is that these guys could make $10 million dollars And Roy Williams is basically making another million for winning games in the NCAA tournament. But you know what? Not one of his players is making a penny. Not a penny. Or legally, they can't. There's just something wrong with that. And, you know, you may not like Robert Montgomery Knight, the general. You know what he did with his sneaker money? He either gave it to his assistants or he donated the money to build, like, libraries at the University of Indiana. It's just crazy what they make, and the players don't get a thing. All right, those are some of my thoughts on the sports world. Let's hear yours. Soccer, give me your thoughts. Will it pass? Do you want it to pass? You've just heard from an economist who thinks it's financially responsible, it's fiscally responsible. Yachty, do you like what's going to happen? Three, four year, three or four years, about $20 million a year. Russell Westbrook, his historical season, college coaches pay. It's absolutely insane. Before we go to break, I do want to tell you about the official accounting firm of the Hollywood Casino Press Box, Anders. Nobody does it better than Anders, folks. They've been around for 50 years. They started with two employees, and now they're up to close to 200. They want to remind you, you enjoy your kids. You enjoy your life. Let them do the work. Small investors, Large businesses, private investors, they do it all. Go to anderscpa.com for more information. We'll take a short time out. Good guest list today. Ricky Horton at 1030, Frank Viverito 1045, and, of course, the Friday Slop with Charles Tuna Edwards and Andy Strickland coming up at 11. We'll be right back after this.